on liking or subscribing to anything for that ass salamander. Besides, these green babes don't have any time for miniature dorklings. So I'm going to get out of here. Oops. Shit. Rocks and older. Maybe, Maybe I, I should, should just, just like, like and, and subscribe, subscribe to, to Miniature, Miniature Dork, Dork Universe. Universe. So I'm basing these for O Group. So the basing is a little different than the Crossfire stuff I've been doing. Um, and so what I did is I had all these leftover Flames of War bases, because I use a lot of the Flames of War miniatures for the 15 millimeter scale stuff, but for Crossfire I'm using a different base size. So I have all of these leftover bases. So I thought I'll use them for O Group. Um, and I'm going to try some different basing methods here. Uh, what I did is put a little piece of, I bought some plastic strips like this uh, and cut them to size. And that's going to be where my labels are going to go on these ones. And because the figures are so small and their rifles are kind of delicate, I don't want to handle them that much. And so they have a the, the token magnetized bottom that I do. I put them in metal tins. So when I take them out, I don't want to grab them by the figures because they're pretty small, right? So I've made these. These are just half round um, evergreen pieces that I bought and cut to size and glued them to the side. And they're just little handholds so I can pick that out of the uh, metal box and place them around the table. And I've roughened them up quite a bit so that the paint will stay on. We'll see if the paint stays on. And I'm going to use different painting method for these. I'm going to just paint in the colors and then use a wash, like do, do a more speed painting kind of technique. And I'll show you the colors that I use for my US, especially in the Italian campaign, they often didn't wear their uh, their jacket. Um, I don't have the, uh, <laughs> I forget what they call it, you know, the M43 combat jacket or something. I'll find that out and tell you later. But anyway, they kind of discarded that um, because it was hot um, early, late summer, early fall in Italy, uh, southern Italy. So often you just see them with their sort of, uh, sort of drab brown color um, shirts and, and that kind of go with the pants. I'll, I'll bring up some pictures down the road as we're painting and talk about that in more detail. But yeah, a lot of these guys are more brown looking than they would have been in, say, Normandy or uh, Northwest Europe. Um, and so some of these figures are sculpted so that you can paint those in looking like that. And then some of them clearly you can see signs that they're wearing the jacket. So I'm going to have a bit of both. So I'll show you, show you what colors I use for that. Um, and to paint these, yeah, I'm going to do the speed painting with washes. So I'm going to first, I'm going to give it an overall spray of uh, Tamiya Flat Earth. I'm going to spray everything. The Tamiya paints are so resilient that I can, I'm fine using these as primers. They, they paint on really well. For Americans, I use the uh, Vallejo um, U.S. Field Drab for the pants, and in this case, the shirts too, for some of them. Um, but instead, I'm going to use this Tamiya uh, as a base coat, and then, um, you know, it's close. It's not exactly the same, but these things are so small too, and once I put the wash on and everything, I think it's a close enough for what I'm usually using. And if I do brush paint some of these, like I might do brush painting on vehicle crews and things, so, you know, it's, it's close enough that they're not going to look ridiculous together. And plus, you know, uniform colors are never, you know, exactly the same. <laughs> so, yeah, that's how we'll go. So first step will be to uh, hit it with, with a coat of this, which is not focusing for some reason. Come on, you dick. Anyway. You know what uh, Tamiya Flat Earth looks like. <laughs> That's what that is. 
Right. So as mentioned, we're putting on our coat of Tamiya Flat Earth, and I'm just using my airbrush to this end. It's nice and fast. <clears throat> and we'll paint up all of the figures in this way, just being careful to put in nice light coats and building them up to get them nice and opaque. The details are very small, so you could easily ruin them with having thick coats of paint. So be careful there. And I wouldn't pay too, too much attention to the base. Have enough paint on the base so further paint coats go on, but that's all getting covered later anyway. We're mostly focusing on the figures here. Now that the Tamiya has dried, that's going to be the core color of the infantry. So the first color we'll start with is the Parsons jackets. I looked it up. So this thing was called a Parsons jacket or an M1942, I think. And they come in a variety of colors. So I think typically like the Flames of War painting guide sort of shows them as being a khaki color and the webbing being like a green gray color. Well, I'm kind of inverting this. I've done a little looking of, on my own and it's possible for them to be either way, but I'm going with the jacket being more of a khaki greeny gray color and my webbing is going to be more of a light khaki color. And there's tons of variation in this. Um, if you look into U.S. uniforms from the Second War, you're going to see a lot of variation. Not to uh, mention, too, that this stuff would fade in the sun pretty fast. I'm putting up a picture of my own jacket here. That's roughly a color that you would see a U.S. uniform um, and how it's faded in the sun over time. My Parsons jacket color is a mix of German camouflage beige from Vallejo and Russian uniform. So I took two drops of the beige and one drop of the Russian uniform. And it went very light um, because these figures are so small. So we're trying to make up for that scale effect. Plus it's going to get a wash on it too. So keep your colors pretty light. Overall, overall you want them lighter. When you look at my pictures, they look huge. They look more like a 135 figure. So it might look light in the photos, but really... When you'll see them smaller later, like you're going to see what I'm talking about. You want to go light. So what you see here is the jacket extending underneath the web gear. And this is how I'm determining whether or not I'm going to paint on a Parsons jacket or just leave it with the field drab shirt. That was just the standard shirt that matched the pants. Um, the rest of the figures that don't have that, I, I left it as just the shirt. Now the collar is going to look like a jacket collar on the shirt, so that's not so great, but they're so small that you're not gonna tell the difference. You really can't, <laughs> so it works out. The herringbone twill uniform was another uniform offered to US soldiers in World War II. It was primarily designed as a work uniform, but then it was also worn in Operation Torch almost exclusively, uh, but it wasn't long until the soldiers reverted back to their just their basic wool drab uniform even in hot places like north africa and sicily i'm not sure why but my memory like i didn't research the hell out of this but my memory's telling me i think that these herringbone twill uniforms weren't very popular um, they were also worn exclusively by the army in the pacific but i think maybe the marines had their own don't quote me on that but the marines uniform i think was better i think for some reason, I think it was the material that wasn't liked. It was stiff or something, um, but it was a cooler option. Uh, however, you do see, yeah, you do see mostly the wool uniforms being worn. I'm just throwing it in here as a, a color variation. So that that picture you saw of the two guys with the uh, American flag armbands were uniforms at the torch landings in the herringbone twill. Um, that's from a book called uh, The World War II GI from Crawmore, Crowwood Press. So if you see, some of these pictures are from that, um, if you're interested. And then I have a lot of these pictures from Time Life books. This one here, um, you see one guy wearing the HBT uniform bits. Um, the guy with the large pack, the large bag there. Um, so yeah. All these uniform bits are chucked in. The guy right at the front of the line has his Parsons jacket on and then everybody else is just wearing the drab stuff. 
My mix for the HBT uniform is two drops of US dark green and one drop of green sky. And of course, it's all Vallejo. The Vallejo logo's up there. I'm not a Vallejo salesman, but if you've not seen this stuff before, I'm just putting it up here. So if you go to buy this stuff, you recognize <laughs> I don't know what you're looking for. It's just a bit easier. Now we're on to the webbing. And as I mentioned before, this could be a variety of different colors. It can have more greenish tones, or in this case, I use like a more beige. And that's just to get more contrast with the uniform colors. Um, and I'm going extra light, remember, for that scale effect. Here's a picture out of an Osprey book on US equipment. Um, here you can also see on that web gear, all of the little snaps are painted black. So I'm going to do that. <laughs> Just It's insane, but it's a, actually a fairly easy detail to make things pop. But that's going to be further down the line. Just remember to go light because it's going to end up looking a lot darker. These figures are shown up so close that they look more like 135 scale, um, but in actuality, they're very small. The color I use for this is stone gray. Um, yep, just straight up. We're not mixing it with anything else. It's a very light, sort of beigey color. And yeah, it looks pretty good, I think. Now we're on to the leather boots, pistol holders, and etc. So here's another Osprey book of U.S. infantry in Mediterranean theater. Um, the other thing that isn't in the picture, it's in the previous picture, the bayonet scabbard at the end has a leather cap to prevent the tip from punching through. So I just added those in. The color I'm going to use for this is saddle brown, just straight up. It's fairly light kind of brown and it's a nice color to use for leather. For the rifle stocks, I'm just going to use beige brown. I also did the, the spade handles beige brown. Sometimes they were painted green, uh, but I went with beige brown just for a little variation. Um, now the brown that you usually see rifle stocks of US weapons is more of a reddish brown, but again, taking it into scale effect, beige brown works pretty well. The blued steel for all of the weapons and the non-camouflaged painted metal parts, like on the bayonets, I paint in black gray. Oh yeah, and later on I painted all the snaps on all the web gear that you could see in all the uh, ammunition pouches, just a little dot of that same black gray. We're getting closer to getting all the main colors blocked in. So now we're on to the helmets and camo painted metal like ammo boxes and weapons like mortars and bazookas that were painted. For that I used Vallejo um, Brown Violet. That color is now called US Olive Drab, I think. Pretty sure it is. And I just went straight up from the bottle. The last of the main colors to block in is flesh. And I always do it last. Some people do it first. I just find it easier to do it last. And for that, I use um, sunny skin tone and medium flesh tone. Once all of the colors are put down, we're gonna give the entire figure a wash. And for this, I use Citadel Agrax Earthshade. So go over the entire figure, including the skin. We're not going to use a different wash for the flesh because it's so tiny, it's not going to matter. Okay guys, I uh, deleted this part of the video, so sorry. I'm not able to demonstrate what I was talking about here, but I will talk about it now. What I was showing you that I deleted was sometimes when you're using like these Citadel washes, or I've had the same thing happen with uh, Vallejo washes too, um, you end up with this almost like white frosted shit instead of, you know, like you're putting on your Agrax earth shade to get shadows and they end up turning like a frosted white color. Um, so that can be really crushing, <laughs> you know, if you don't know how to fix it. Um, and what I was showing you, I actually fixed it, but sorry, like I said, I, I freaking deleted the video like a spaz. Um, to fix it, I just get a f small paintbrush and paint Tamiya clear over that frosted white area and then it just disappears. It goes back to the shaded color that you want it to be. Um, now the, the Tamiya clear is a bit glossy, 
but that doesn't really matter because the Citadel shade actually makes everything go kind of glossy. So it's going to need a matte coat anyway. So putting a thing of uh, clear Tamiya over it isn't going to make a big deal. And I, I just use Tamiya clear because that's what I have. You could also try using any any kind of gloss or even maybe even a satin varnish if you whatever varnishes that you have. It seems like that frosted area is just um I don't know, it's I don't know what it is. In fact, if any of you know what the hell that is, could you please let me know in the comments below? Because it really does piss me off when you paint all of this stuff painstakingly and then you get the shit that's made for like doing the wash and it fucks it up. It kind of makes you want to like punch some stuff and drink some things uh, that aren't good for your brain and liver. So to avoid that, let me know. How do you get around that? And there's no instructions on any of this stuff either. Uh, it doesn't tell you to shake it or, or anything. It's just Citadel Agrax Earthshade and it goes on looking great. You think, oh yeah, that's going to be awesome. In fact, here, I think I see a spot that's still white in beside. I don't know if you'll be able to see it on this camera, but on the inside of this guy's uh, BAR. God, I, I can't tell if it's in focus because my monitor's so small, but we'll, we'll pretend like it is. <laughs> I'm just going to demonstrate because it's nice when you see how quickly and effectively it deals with that white shit. You know, it's it's kind of like <laughs> encouraging because sometimes you just feel like putting the project down and calling it a failure. But we don't do that at Miniature Dork Universe. We persevere and bring success stories. So there's that white shit in with the BAR and I've just painted it in. I don't know if it's easily seen here but it did just disappear. So I'll obviously at the end of this, I'm gonna show you guys like uh, close-ups of all these in stills. So you'll be able to see how nicely they still turned out even though a large number of them ended up with that frosted shit, which I don't know what it is. I tried looking it up online and someone said it was due to uh, not mixing it enough, but it doesn't even look like there's stuff to mix. Like when you turn it upside down, there's no pigment in it. But I've also read online that it's when you mix water with it. But I'm not sure if I'd want to put that straight up. I feel like if I put it straight up without watering it down, it would be way too dark. So again, if you have the magical answer and you can answer it, you're going to be the hero <laughs> of this month. Okay, we'll move on to the next steps. Now that we've had our little rant, we're going to start with our highlighting. So we'll start off by doing the uh, uniform highlight which is going to be a mix of field drab and buff one drop to one drop and just hitting all the high points to make those things jump. For the webbing and legging highlight I mix some just straight up white into the stone gray one drop to one drop. So now we'll get on to the Parsons jacket highlights. So we're going to use the original camouflage beige and Russian uniform ratio and add a drop of white in. And then for the HBT uniform highlight, we're going to use the same colors again, but we're going to use less of the U.S. dark green. Helmets and camouflage painted equipment highlights. I took the original brown violet and added in a drop of middle stone. So two drops to one drop gives a nice bright highlight. Um, rifle stocks, I just reuse the straight up um, beige brown. I wanted the rifles to be a bit darker than the rest of the uniform, so I didn't want to lighten that up too much. And it was an adequate highlight for that, I thought. The boot and leather highlight, also the strap along the front of some of the helmets, I just added some orange brown, one drop to one drop, and that's always a nice bright highlight for leather. Um, gun highlights and ammo labels for the guns I use London Grey carefully with a fine brush and then for the labels on ammo cans just flat yellow stippled on with a very fine brush to give it that kind of label look. Deep shadows areas where I wanted to emphasize more I used uh, German camouflage black brown 
just to let it pop out a little more or to cover up any little mistakes along the edges of the webbing. And then on the helmets, I've dry brushed with the highlight color for the webbing and I found it a little light. So I went back and gave it another coating of the Agrax Earthshade straight up and it looks pretty good. The bases, I paint the color that I'm gonna mix into my groundwork. So in this case, it was cheapy craft paint. It was uh, honeycomb from folk art. And I did all of the bases like that so they'll blend right in with the groundwork. As you can see, we've got the entire company painted and now it's time to start with the groundwork on the basing. And so to do this, I'm going to use my basic groundwork that I always use. Um, to not be too repetitive in all these videos, I'm not going to go over this, you know, at length. If you want to see me use this and apply it, um, watch my video on the KNIL uh, Dutch in the Dutch East Indies. Um, I show you how I use this stuff. Here's one of the bases. And I'm just going to give, I don't have much in my bottle here, so I'll mix up some more, but I'll use up the rest for now. I just keep it in an old Tamiya bottle. I get a, whoop, I get a scoop off. <laughs> That's my cat playing with his toy in the background. <laughs> Hopefully it's not too loud for you guys. He's pretty funny though. He's going to town right now, having a good time. So with this sculpting tool, I'm just plopping it on and spreading it out. Getting it onto the base to cover up the edges, but leaving it a little distance from the feet. You won't see those tiny little flat areas that are left once it's all dry. I do try to kind of like flatten down the edge though so you don't get a really clearly defined um, edge between the base and the groundwork. So I'm going to plot on with this and then I'll just show you what it looks like once all of the groundwork is on. Here I've laid down all the groundwork on the base and pressed in some rocks that are just decorative stones that I got at the dollar store. They last for years and years. So I will paint all the rocks slightly different shades, like the larger rocks, just to add some color variation. So for now, it doesn't matter. Some of them are actually silver. Some of them are actually quite a nice shade already. So sometimes I just leave it. Um, but at this stage, I'm pressing them in and just getting them ready. And when it's dry, I'll seal them all in with some watered down adhesive of some type. I'll, qu I'll talk quickly about, you know, my criteria for basing. And for me, there's four main criteria. The, the first criteria, obviously, is that you're grouping your figures the way they need to, to relate to any particular gaming system, right? And so each gaming system has their own sort of basing requirements, and some are looser than others. Um, for these, I'm basing them for O group. And so it is a fairly loose basing requirement. They, they want you to base the figures in sections that represent sections of 10 guys, like your basic infantry section. So for this I'm using four on um, surplus Flames of War bases. I find that four I can space out nicely enough so that when you're doing a large army you'll have enough figures from one, one packet of uh, figures. These are the Victrix figures. Um, but also when they're spaced out a little more, it's easier to get all that groundwork in, especially, you know, an old group is, is sort of a larger sized game with smaller scale figures. So when you have to do, you know, a hundred figures, it's a bit easier to get all that basing material in and thus a bit faster. So first criteria is, is to base the figures and the groups that they need to be for any given game. My second criteria is to identify those groups. And so the groups are identified really by the weapons that they have. When you see these guys, they have 
basic infantry weapon, so the assumption is, you know, it's an infantry squad. However, um, I put a label on, and that'll tell what squad, what platoon, what company. This is a battalion-sized game, so each base will have its um, place within an actual company or battalion. Um, and so that kind of uh, recognition is also kind of helpful in a game. Um, it doesn't just become a blur of guys based on bases that largely look the same, right? So it, it helps you identify those. And when these are so small too, sometimes it's harder to see some of the individual <laughs> weapons. Like here's a, here's a, what the Americans would call a light machine gun. It's actually the, uh, the Browning M1919. Um, it's very small. So when this is marked as a Browning 19, M1919, uh, it'll be that much easier to identify on the table. So that's sort of my second criteria. Third criteria of the base is to protect the figures. Um, so from handling, obviously you're going to handle them a lot. Uh, so for these, these 12 millimeter figures are very delicate, really, like the rifles and the actual figures themselves. You want to handle them as little as possible. So on these bases, like I showed before, I glued down these um, these half round pieces, and it just makes it so that when you go to pick it up, there's something for your fingernail to grab. Because when you have that beveled edge, it becomes more difficult to handle, right? So, so now you don't even have to touch the figures to move them. They quite easily move around. So that was the reasoning behind this, to protect the figures. And then, for me, the fourth criteria is just to add to the overall aesthetic of what you're making. You know, if you spend any time trying to paint the figures to look nice, then the basing really is going to make them explode, <laughs> you know, and make them look, look very appealing once they're all done. Um, and you can achieve a lot with the basing just to make your figures look great. And so... That's what I'm trying to do. I, you know, I sat down years ago to figure out what my personal criteria for this would be if I was going to do gaming, and uh, that was it. And so I think all these years later, this is sort of the pinnacle of what I've tried to achieve. The groundwork has been placed on and the rocks put in. I'm going to paint the rocks the same color as the base. Um, I might leave some of the already brown rocks showing. I just do this so that when I paint, I'm going to paint all the rocks slightly different colors. So I do this to make that process easier. If it's, you know, it's less essential to paint exactly, you know, every inch of the rock when you have it painted this color first, the base color. And so that step is good and easy. I know I say this in every video, but this, uh, this cellu clay has been with me since the 90s, like early, like 1991. And I use it for all of my, uh, my basing. For some reason, it just seems to be endless, but it's, it's like one of my oldest friends, <laughs> you know. <laughs> just doesn't seem, it's always there, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So I will go and paint all of this. I also added some things um, to the bazookas in the mortars. Let's see if I can find that mortar. I've added these little uh, canister shape, you know, the, the rockets and the mortar shells were often held in these um, cardboard canisters. Um, so I'll paint those also with the groundwork color before I paint them. They were black in reality with a, usually a yellow stripe around them. So I'll come back and paint those. I'll use my, uh, I use black gray for black. I have one that's open, so I'll probably paint the inside of that straight up black. But it's kind of a scale effect thing. So yeah, anything here um, that's going to be painted later, I paint with the basic brown color. 
just so that, like I said, I don't have to be as accurate when I'm painting these things. I can be fast, which is what you kind of want to do when you have so many things to paint. I'll probably just leave the rocks, the brown rocks, brown. And I, the, when I paint them, I'll just put like a tint of a color on them. Not like a straight up hard color. The other thing you might find on, if you use cellulite, is every once in a while there's actually little ripped up pieces of magazine in there, <laughs> you know. So it's like ripped up ad from, you know, 1991 thereabouts. Um, so if you see like little blue or red pieces peeking through, um, you can paint those as well. Hmm. This rock is coming off. Didn't stick down, but I will probably just glue that down. Oh, a lot of these rocks are coming off. I'm going to give these a coat of glue over top too to seal everything in. So I'll finish that and we'll come back when the next stage is ready. Which will be probably painting these rocks. The main basing material has been placed down and I painted all the rocks. Um, the, uh, I forget, the honey brown I think this color was. Um, and I left some of the other ones sort of the color they were. And now I'm going to go in and actually paint all of the larger rocks in various shades of lighter colors. I looked at pictures of Italy, so the rock does seem to be a, a lighter color there. So I'm going to use just these craft acrylics. I got four different colors, so I'm just going to mix, mix it up on the base. I might even leave some of them the honey color. Um, but I'm not going to go into great detail about that. If you want to see how I did some of this sort of Mediterranean basing in deeper detail, um, check out my video on making cypress trees. I'll put a little link at the end of this video if you want to check that out. I just don't want to keep repeating the same stuff over and over again. So, yeah, I'm going to go through and just randomly, you know, use my artistic license to paint these rocks lighter. I'll give the bigger rocks... Uh, a wash of a darker color and then dry brush them very light probably with off-white maybe even straight up white um, and then the the groundwork I'm gonna dry brush you know a, a series of lighter colors like a couple of lighter colors and um, I'll come back when all of that's painted and I'll show you like I'm gonna put a bit of foliage and groundwork on <clears throat> but it's gonna be kind of arid crusty looking stuff Maybe a little more arid, you know, southern Italy is pretty warm, but, uh, and it's arid in spots, but it's also very green in spots, so you could go either way with this. I'm, I'm really trying to make these sort of generic, though, like these guys could be in Sicily or even, t t you know, they could be in Tunisia or Italy. I finished all of the painting of the rocks. I painted them sort of, I used four colors like I showed you before and just use some dry brush. I gave the wash, or sorry, I gave the rocks a wash of watered down Vallejo German camouflage medium brown. And that was a really nice color that went with these colors, like they blended in nicely. I used a bit of it to shade in this uh, bomb crater too, and it, it really was a, you know, it was just by accident that I picked that color. I just wanted a darker brown but it ended up being a very complementary color. So if you use those similar colors that I showed you, um, that's a good one. I fast forwarded ahead here quite a bit and got most of the basing done. And um, rather than show this again, if you're new to the channel, just look at my uh, KNIL video. It'll show you more of the steps I do in the actual basing, but I've basically put down my um, groundwork and I used fine turf to make kind of mossy ground cover and then just various kinds of um, clump foliage torn up small to make kind of those scruffy sort of bush, bushy type sage bush, you know, arid country looking um, vegetation. 
and then I threw in some uh, dried out grass, like static grass, and I used my uh, AliExpress Wonder <laughs> static grass applicator from China that electrocutes me. Although I got through this one without any electrical shocks, so that was okay. Um, and I put my token uh, labels on, the areas that I glued to the backs of the uh, Flames of War bases. And if you want to see more about the labels, um, there's a whole video on that too. So just go into my channel and take a look at what I got. Um, I just don't want to be too repetitive for people that have seen my stuff. And of course, if you have any specific questions, just ask me in the comments below. Ah, comments below and I'm happy to get back to you. Um, so, uh, yeah, I based it, I labeled it, I kind of the white edges of the plastic around the label that were left I painted in and the edges of the base I painted in with US Field Drab. And what I'm going to do for each company is paint that area around the base a different color to further help me identify the individual companies and units. So the next one will probably get like a khaki outline and then the next one might get like the US um, olive drab color. I'll just use US colors, you know, something from the actual uniform coming down onto the base. I, I think it all ties it in quite nicely. Like as you see, the whole thing I think looks pretty nice, <laughs> the way it ties in and the way it looks. And that's kind of what we're going for here. Um, so you may be just more of a gamer and want to do it qu quicker and you can totally do that and skip all this. Um, but I'm a guy that has a <laughs> background in graphic design so of course I go a little crazy but I, I really like it when games have that uh, next level kind of look and that's, you know, it ends up being a, a really nice game piece. Um, and so I like it when every corner of the table has something to look at that sort of draws your attention and your imagination. So the next step, I'm just, these are magnetized, so I've got a block of steel. I jam it on the block of steel so I don't have to handle the base. I have more of this stuff that I've watered down, the golden um, soft gel. And what I'm going to do is paint that on the little... Uh, the little pickup handles that I've added on um, and that'll keep my fingers from wearing off the paint and I'll stick them in areas where they might get handled like underneath the label it's another area to really pick it up um, the the corners of the label sometimes get flaked off from handling um, so I'll put some around the corners uh, yeah and so I'll go through and do all the bases with that and it's just a simple matter. I, I water this stuff down a little bit so that it's got the consistency of uh, hmm, I'm trying to think of what has this consistency. It's not like milk, it's thicker than that but it's not as thick as the actual um, the actual soft gel. But you don't want it super thick. The, the actual stuff, even the soft gel, is quite thick and I just put sort of a thin layer down but this this stuff dries very hard. I mean it still has a kind of plasticky finish like a like a acrylic finish what you would imagine acrylic to be like but it's just it's kind of like white glue times 10. <laughs> yeah it's it's got that sort of rubbery but much tougher which is exactly what you want. It, it is you know it'll provide a fairly effective barrier to prevent your paint from getting scraped off. And then once this is done, all that I have left to do is I'm going to um, add some spent shell casings to the machine gun stands because I find that always looks kind of cool. And then I will give it um, all a matte coat. The, the finish of the matte gel is slightly different than the, you know, than the matte finish of the Vallejo paint that I use, the US Field Drab. And some of the, I used Mod, Mod Podge for my foliage and there's some areas where it's kind of glossy. So I'm gonna give it a final coat. It'll also take the sheen off the print. Um, so I'll give it a final coat of the, uh, the AK um, Ultra Matte, which I love. 
I find that ultra matte really, um, really unifies all the finishes and colors and makes everything look great. I'm not going too crazy with the paint on the corners too, just enough to sort of soak into the paper and keep the paper from flaking away. And something I'll say too, when you're doing your, if you do a matte coat over your labels, the first coat, make it really light and let it dry completely. It'll dry pretty fast, you know, within a minute, it'll be dry. But just, just build up light coats because if you really soak it, your inks are going to bleed and then you're going to really say some bad words. <laughs> okay, so remember I said that. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to continue on um, putting the acrylic gel over my uh, little handles here and um, then I'll come back and uh, show you how, I'll, I'll show you how I put the matte coat over the labels. Um, yeah, and something else I'll say too is these little handles work really well for picking these up. Like, you don't really have to handle the, the figures and it, uh, it just gives you that little round bumper to get your fingernails under or something. Or, you know, and you just get one side up and then you can pick it up a lot easier than when it's just, uh, you know, they're actually not really designed well if you want to keep your fingers off the figures. And um, maybe for metal Flames of War figures, which is what these were initially designed for, that's, uh, that's okay. But these tiny, tiny little 12 millimeter, they have a bunch of little rifles or even the figures themselves, their legs aren't very thick. You don't want to be like picking this up by the figures. So anything that makes the base a little easier to pick up, and I'm sure there's there's many other things you could come up with um, that don't look, you know, I find this though doesn't look super intrusive. You kind of see them on the edges, but it, it looks okay. It doesn't look like, oh. Uh, and, and overall, it, yeah, I'm really pleased with how it turned out. So we'll keep plugging on and I'll get back to you when we're doing our um, matte coat. My last step in this little project is going to be to put some spent shell casings around the 50 caliber and 30 caliber machine gun. So to do that, I'm just going to extrude some of this uh, plastic. Use tan if you have it. It's just a piece of sprue um, because you're going to paint it brass and the brass paint will go over the tan color like a lot smoother in one coat. You won't have to keep painting it and you'll be able to keep the paint fairly thin. I do this instead of actually using brass because it's going to be hard to get, <clears throat> sorry, my freaking voice is getting hoarse here. <laughs> um, the brass is going to be hard to get in the diameter you need, especially in 12 mil. This you have some control. You know, I'll get the diameter for both the 30 cal and the 50 cal on the same extruded piece just by waiting a little bit for it to cool before you pull some more. So I'll show you. We're going to get our super wicked blasty torch here. Simply light my hippie candle on a piece of birch bark. You don't need a candle on a piece of birch bark. <laughs> Any candle will do. No, it works better when it's a birch bark candle. Seriously, man. So don't hold it too close to the flame because you don't want to melt the shit out of it or have it catch on fire. And then when it starts to sort of droop a bit, then extrude. And so the thinner part in the middle is going to be for my 30 cal and the thicker stuff near the ends is going to be for my 50 cal. And uh, what I will do is Cut the very tiny pieces. You got to be careful because they're going to want to pop off and fly off everywhere. So keep your hand around it, chop, 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 chop out, um, and try and keep them around the same length. Um, cut the tiny pieces. Well, first paint it brass. So for that, this is a good thing. Hold on. For that, I use this stuff. It's like Vallejo metal color. It's actually for an airbrush, but it paints on quite nicely. If you use the stuff in the smaller bottles, like like this Game Workshop shit, it's like goopy shit. It sucks. And there's like little, almost like glitter, <laughs> you know, stuck inside. So, you probably don't see this little wire here, but uh, 
not wire this extruded sprue, but use a half decent brush again so that your paint goes on nicely and just paint it and you'll see that the color covers it instantly and this paint has a nice smooth finish. You're not going to have this bumpy crappy looking metallic. So I will finish on with this. I'm going to cut these into little pieces and what I do is just put a little drop of Mod Podge on where I want them to go and I'm just going to sprinkle them on and then use something, you know, like a dental pick to push any of the pieces down that are kind of loose. Okay, so I've chopped my little pieces off of the sprue. You might not even be able to see them, they're in this little scoop. And I'm going to put a bit of Mod Podge down beside the machine gun and then just tap that down into there and the spent casings will be in place. So I finished putting the spent shell casings on the machine guns and I put um, the soft gel around the edges here just to protect them from handling. And now to finish it off we're just going to give it a coat of good old Ultra Varnish from AK. Um, this can go directly into your airbrush, you don't have to thin it down. And I'll just show you how I spray the label so I don't bleed the inks. And that'll be it. It'll be done. Finished project. So I start by putting a very light coat on the label. It'll dry really quickly so you can come back to it quite quickly, but it just creates a barrier so that the varnish isn't going to soak into the paper and make your inks bleed. So just be very careful around that. That's the only thing I would stress about this. Everything else is just straight up spraying matte coat on something. So, you know, I'm sure you can figure that out. Just, again, take your time with the labels. Because if your inks bleed at this point, boy, are you ever going to say some bad words. And here we are done. Here's the whole uh, company done. Three platoons and uh, the company commander and the uh, heavy weapons platoon with the light machine guns and light mortars. And I also did an M250 caliber machine gun. Um, in the rules for O group, they can't be attached to platoons, but they can be used um, independently um, for defensive fire, things like that. Um, so it adds a bit of a punch to the company. And then there's these um, combat patrols. In the game, you can just use like a, a chit, you know, something with that. You know, people are just using things like this, but I've decided, hopefully that's in focus, I've decided to use um, actual figures on a round base. And each um, company is going to have three of these combat patrols. So I painted up two. The third one's actually going to have this Jeep on it. The Jeep is from uh, Butler's Printed Models and the drivers and sitting riflemen are from Pendragon. I just didn't paint those because it's going to be a different kind of painting operation so I'll do that separately. So that's it. I feel like they turned out pretty good. So I'll finish this out. Nor as I normally do with uh, stills. Hey, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Tamarine, man. Sleepy, and there is no place I'm going to. In the jingle jangle morning, I'll come following you. Take me on a trip. On your magic swirling ship 
my senses have been stripped. My hands can't feel to grip. My toes too numb to step. Wait only for my boot heels to be wandering. I'm ready to go anywhere. I'm ready for the fade into my own parade. Cast your dance and spell my way. I promise to go under it. I'm not sleepy and there is no place I'm going to. In the jingle, jangle morning, I'll come following you. <laughs> <laughs>